The Gospel today tells us about a man who is born dumb, or we would say today mute, whom our Lord cures. When we think about this condition, our first thought is to think about what a tragedy it is that he has this terrible disability. He is unable to communicate his thoughts with other people. And it seems like a very difficult and unpleasant trial to have as he goes through life. But how many Catholics are mute regarding things of their souls? They are mute when they are supposed to be praying to God or asking for the forgiveness of their sins, when they are supposed to be going to the confessional and telling the priest the sins they have committed so that they can be forgiven. And even though they are not able to speak when their soul requires it, they do speak to the great detriment of their souls all the time. They swear and curse and they take God's name in vain. And they calumniate and detract their neighbors. This last sin is one that I want to talk about today on the improper use of our tongues in order to injure our neighbor's reputation. There are generally two sins by which we can harm our neighbor by speech, detraction and calumny. Detraction is to reveal our neighbor's faults which are real, and calumny is to spread false, uh, spread, spread lies about him, or accuse him of faults or crimes that he is not guilty of. But I mainly want to talk about detraction today, because it is a more common and actually more dangerous sin than calumny. It causes injury to a person's good reputation. The sin is called detraction, not because it detracts from the truth, or takes away from the truth, but as St. Thomas Aquinas tells us, because it takes away our neighbor's good reputation by removing the good opinion that people have about him when we tell them about bad things that he has done. It's not detraction, though, to reveal someone's hidden faults, when this is necessary for that person's correction or conversion, or to warn people who may be in serious danger of being harmed by that person, who are unaware of the danger that this person presents to them. But even in those relatively rare, necessary situations, we can only reveal someone's hidden faults out of love for that person and not out of anger or hatred for him. There are examples in the Bible when good people revealed the hidden faults of others for their improvement, such as the patriarch Joseph. He saw some of his brothers committing some evil sin and he reported this to their father Jacob. Unfortunately, his brothers only became hardened and began to hate Joseph for this, but he still did it with a good intention. And our Lord himself warned the people of Israel about the hidden sins of the Pharisees because the Pharisees were leading people astray. But every form of false testimony and also detraction is forbidden by the Eighth Commandment. Now, first of all, calumny is to accuse someone of a crime he didn't commit, and this is a very grievous sin. In the Mosaic Law, it inflicted the same penalty on a false witness that the false witness would have brought on the innocent victim if his testimony had been true. Even the pagans punished false testimony with death. But detraction, when we, what we say is actually true, is a little different. And someone might wonder, well, what is wrong with saying something that is true? We will see that here. First of all, doing this usually shows great malice. And it comes from someone's pride and envy normally to hurt someone's good reputation. 
People hurt the reputations of others as if they themselves were not guilty of any fault. And they tend to think the worst about other people and to portray their evil deeds in the worst possible light because they themselves tend to be wicked. People like this make the hidden weaknesses and, or crimes of others their favorite topic of conversation. And they're always looking down on others. But the virtue of charity requires us to look favorably on other people and to have compassion for other people's failings. A charitable person tries to conceal and diminish the faults of others rather than publish them and, and create scandal. They tend to judge other people with mercy. That is what we're supposed to do. But someone who detracts and even rejoices at the downfall of his neighbor and takes a, a bad interpretation of all of the actions of other people is a malicious person. <clears throat> people like this even interpret good actions in a bad light and they enjoy dragging other people down and they don't care about the divisions and, and quarrels and enmities that they create by doing this. St. James says about detraction that it is a devouring fire, a world of iniquity, a restless evil full of deadly poison. The detractor likes to dig up old faults of others that may have been long since repented of and repaired. And evil, even saying evil things about people who are already dead and judged by God. Now, someone who is the victim of this, the victim of detraction, can go from being a good and upright person in the eyes of other people to being a complete wreck almost literally overnight. Once someone's reputation is destroyed, people tend to forget about all the good that that person did. They think only of, of something evil that he did. St. Francis de Sales says that someone in this position becomes like a dead member of the community. He goes from a position of honor and respect to being the object of contempt and infamy. Really, it's better to be falsely accused of something than to have someone reveal our, our true faults if, if they are hidden. Because a false accusation generally eventually comes out and the person is ultimately vindicated very often. But if someone's secret fault is something true, he can't deny it. It's almost impossible to live something like that down. And even if the person that spread that rumor is, is sorry and repents for what he did, he really has almost no way to repair that damage because he can't retract what he said or deny it if it's true. Someone who has lost his reputation because of detraction is hardly ever able to recover it, which is why St. Bernard says that detraction is a very grievous crime. Someone might be wondering, but if someone really is guilty of some fault that is a, a hidden fault, why should we care about his reputation? He deserves whatever happens to him when his fault comes to light. But this is not true. Regardless of what someone's private conduct might be, as long as he treats others with justice and respect and is not publicly known to be an evil person, which would certainly happen if he went around violating the rights of numerous people everywhere, his sins are really a matter between himself and God. And when people do commit crimes against numerous people, they very quickly are, are exposed to be evil people, and then their crimes are a public matter, and then it's no longer a detraction because it is common knowledge. But if someone injures only, let's say, a few people in a matter that is not generally known, but everyone else he, he, he treats well, his sins are a matter between him and, and the few people that he has injured, 
And they are not something that concerns the public as a whole. And this is where the injustice of revealing it comes in. It involves a great number of people in a matter that doesn't concern them at all and inflicts usually a much greater harm on the victim of the detraction than he inflicted on his own victims, uh, assuming he has some. To destroy someone's reputation is a far greater harm than robbing that person of money or physical possessions. Because our good name is more valuable to us than earthly possessions. It says in the book of Proverbs exactly this. It says, Is not a good name preferable to great riches? If a poor person has a reputation for being honest, he can usually get by and even use his good name to, to help his standing in life because people will generally trust him and it'll be easy for him to, to get a job, for example. But once someone acquires a reputation of being unjust, no amount of money can ever repair that harm. And if the victim of detraction has already confessed his sins in the sight of God and made reparation for them, then it is even more unjust to drag those sins into the light even after God has forgiven that person. And we are not able to know if that has happened or not. In fact, many times people's sins are made public even in the act of repentance, like, like St. Mary Magdalene, who was accused of being a sinner by the Pharisee in the exact moment when she was asking our Lord for forgiveness. But detraction is also very destructive to the person committing the detraction. St. Paul mentions detraction in a list of grievous sins that he says exclude people from heaven. So St. Paul says that this is inherently a mortal sin unless the matter itself is something light. And detraction not only destroys the soul of the person committing the sin, but it very often destroys the soul of, of the victim too. If he gives in to anger or commits revenge against his detractor. In fact, a, de a detractor is also guilty of all of the sins of detraction committed by the people who repeat his tale to one person after another. What a terrible amount of sins he can be responsible for. St. Bernard said that a detractor's tongue is like a double-edged sword. And then he said, no, actually, a triple-edged sword, with which he commits three murders in one stroke. First, he murders his own soul when he wounds his neighbor's reputation. Second, he murders his victim by ruining his reputation. And thirdly, he murders the souls of all those who listen and encourage and spread the story. What a terrible thought all of this is. And how many sins can come from one little statement or one story? How much guilt and damage can someone have from even what seems like a small thing? Someone who commits detraction, like any other form of injustice, is required to repair the damage that he caused by his sin to repair the, the person's reputation that he harmed. But as I said, this is a lot more difficult to do than uh, someone who steals money, for example, uh, like a thief, who can simply give back the money he stole. But it is incredibly difficult to change the minds of people who now think badly about a person whose reputation we have harmed. And we certainly can't go back in time and, and we certainly can't go back to those people, rather, and say that we made up what we said because we didn't make it up. It was really true. And also, we don't even know how many people heard the, the bad story that we told. And it continues to spread even long after we tell it most of the time. In fact, like a snowball, probably each person that repeats the story that we started 
we'll add a little bit more to it to make it more interesting or exciting and make the victim appear continually worse each time it gets repeated. So what someone has to do is to go back and say good things about the person that he harmed in order to balance out and somehow cancel out the evil that he said about him and to admit that he presented that evil in an unfair light or say whatever else he can figure out to say in order to diminish the harm that he caused. Even though it is difficult for human pride to do this and admit that we said something we shouldn't have said, this is strictly required. If we want to be forgiven, we have to repair that damage. We also have to be careful not to listen to detraction either. And if we hear something against our neighbor, we need to just bury it. Not only not repeat it to anyone else, but even bury it in our own minds. Forget about it. And don't act on it in any way. We should make ourselves basically a dead end for any evil tale about our neighbor that, that comes our way. And what is even better than this, if we are in a conversation and someone commits detraction to us, we should say something good about the person who has just been defamed especially if there are other people listening who hear that, so that we diminish the evil effect that that bad statement has. And if we are ever tempted to say something bad about our neighbor, and we are not sure if it is justified or necessary to do that, remember that it is always safer to say less than to say more. In fact, it is extremely rare that it can ever cause harm when we don't say something bad about someone else. Many years ago, I, I think this was when I was in the seminary, I, I was probably involved in some situation involving somebody's reputation. I, I don't remember now what it was. But Father Chicada gave me that advice that I just quoted. He said, it is always safer to say less or to say nothing than to say more. When it comes to revealing bad things about people, even if it seems necessary, because you can always go back later and reveal more, but once you reveal something about someone else, you can never take it back. And the wisdom of this has impressed me more and more over the years since he said this. Almost every time I have been in a situation where it seemed right or necessary to reveal something bad about someone and I decided not to, I always saw later that I had made the right choice. And I don't think I have ever been in a situation where I regretted not revealing something bad about someone else. Although I have had plenty of times where I wish I had said less than I did. And to this day, I consider that advice of Father Chicada to be some of the wisest advice I have ever received. So let us all take this to heart. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.